I'm David Smith, I'm Director of the Kaiser Institute for Christian Teaching and Learning here at Calvin University. A few years ago I got the chance to teach a one credit class as part of the German program uh, here at Calvin and uh, was able to choose the topic and decided that I would like to teach a book called Life Together written by German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer who's one of the more important theologians of the 20th century. He was around in Germany during World War II. In 1935 he was made head of uh, a small seminary in a place called Finkenwalde which is now in Poland and uh, this, this seminary belonged to the Confessing Church which was uh, uh, a branch of the German church that uh, was resisting the, the takeover of the, of, the, of the church in Germany uh, by the, uh, the Nazi apparatus uh, under, under Adolf Hitler. And as he prepared for teaching in the seminary, he put a lot of reflection into thinking about what kind of teaching and learning might be appropriate for students who were going to graduate into very difficult circumstances and needed to be deeply formed as pastors who were, were not going to have an easy set of cultural surroundings. And so he went and looked at Anglican uh, monastic communities, he looked at uh, pietist communities on the continent, and he arrived at a model which was, was partly teaching, he lectured, uh, but where there was a strong emphasis on shared practices, on the way the life together of uh, the seminary community would help to shape his students. In fact, Eberhard Betke, who became a close friend of his and was one of his students, talked about, for instance, one rule that he had where uh, anyone in the community was forbidden from talking about other members of the community in their absence. Uh, and if they caught themselves doing so, they had to confess that they'd done so, go find the other person and tell them what they just said about them. And Becker said that the students learned as much from their constant failures to uh, live up to these kinds of practices as they did from the lectures. There was a sense in which being given these, these disciplines to try to live into and then finding that it was very hard to live into those disciplines, it created a kind of friction that led to a lot of learning that didn't necessarily come just from uh, listening to lectures, reading books. So I was thinking about all of that as I approached teaching this class about life together. Um, it was a one credit class, met on Monday afternoons, we just met for an hour. And we were going to read Bonhoeffer, we were going to read some background literature, and uh, we were going to try to understand him in his German context. Uh, we were going to learn some German. And out of this, uh, we wanted to better understand what Bonhoeffer was trying to do. So I didn't want to just assign the book as a reading, uh, lecture about it, have us do written activities. I wanted just to think about shared practices. So right at the start of the book, the opening chapter of Bonhoeffer's Life Together talks about uh, the nature of Christian community. Uh, he says that we, we belong together solely on the basis of what Christ has done for us. So one of his opening sort of declarations is that the basis of Christian community is, is who Christ died for. It's not uh, if, if the community is based on shared musical tastes, it's an aesthetic community. If it's based on having the same politics, it's a political community. If it's based on having the same demographic, it's, it's another kind of community. It's only a Christian community if the sole basis for community is uh, the relationship to what, what Christ has done. And he then follows on from that to say one of the implications of this is that we should spend less time grumbling about who else got put in the Christian community because it turns out uh, God invited all kinds of other people to be part of the kingdom of God and didn't give you and me a vote. Uh, so we should try to exercise thankfulness for the people that God placed within the Christian community. So I was thinking about how to teach this. So in the first week of the semester, uh, I asked students uh, to read the first, the first section of Life Together in German, uh, to do some background reading, some cultural background. We watched part of a documentary film. But I also asked them to engage in an intentional practice for a week. What I asked them to do was to think of someone they would see every day. Uh, could be someone who was in one of their classes or someone who lived in their dorm. Just someone you would see at least five days out of seven during the week. And to use seeing that person as kind of a trigger so that if you uh, on Monday, you, you ran into the person to remember then to just pause and thank God for their life. I also asked them, if possible, to choose a person who irritated them, choose someone they wouldn't choose to spend the weekend with, choose someone who's got a, um, an annoying laugh, who's got the wrong politics, who doesn't agree with you about anything, who doesn't share your hobbies. And just every time you see them for a week, when you see them, just stop and offer thanks for them just for a minute or so. I said, you may not pray that they will change. That's cheating. Uh, all you've got to do is express thankfulness. So what was striking to me was after one week of doing this, uh, students wrote journals uh, as, they, as they engaged in these practices. 
And after one week of trying this out, here's what one student wrote in their journal. He wrote, there's a student with whom I'm not on friendly terms. We don't fight, but when we're together, it can be a bit awkward. Over the course of the last, last few days, I prayed for this student. The more I prayed for him, the more I found I could stand him. Now I don't find it a problem seeing him around campus. We're not best friends, but I believe things have improved between us. Students started discovering that the degree to which you're annoyed by the other people in your environment is actually partly your responsibility. Uh, that by engaging in intentional practices of thankfulness, you can actually move the needle on your reactions to the people around you and you can start to see them differently. And it only took one week of doing this for a minute a day to start to experience enough friction uh, in your instinctive reactions to start to see some kind of change happening. And it opened up space for thinking about what Bonhoeffer was getting at. So the second week I asked students similarly to choose a person uh, in their environment who they saw most days but whose name they didn't know, someone who was a stranger, someone who maybe worked in food services or went into a different class down the corridor. And just to spend a minute or two each day praying for that person, um, someone who's totally unconnected to your life. And when students came back the following week and we debriefed this in class, students talked about how um, they began to realize through this practice how much of the time when it looked like they were praying for someone else, they were really secretly praying for themselves. They started sharing examples. So if I pray for my parents to be financially blessed and my prayers answered, it helps with tuition. Um, if I pray for my girlfriend to have a great day and my prayers answered, then I have a better evening. Uh, there's this sense that, that sometimes when we look like we're praying for other people, we're really... The underlying prayer is that my life would go well and because life's going well for the people around me. Here's what one student wrote after a week of engaging in praying for a stranger for a few minutes a day. She wrote, I learned that it's a humbling experience to pray for someone you don't know. I have to be totally selfless because I get nothing from the transaction. This other, this nameless other will be more important than I. But I feel better when I'm not so self-centered. It directs my attention more to God and to his big world and not so much to myself then my problems in life are not so important. That frees me. If I'm not so important, my mistakes are not so important. And when I'm not the center, I'm not as alone. It struck me as quite a profound set of reflections to be coming again out of one week of a practice that took maybe two or three minutes a day. Now we carried on experimenting with these kinds of things through the semester. I've written about some of this in a book called On Christian Teaching. Um, but what I want to reflect on here for a moment is how um, Preparing for this class and thinking through the way Bonhoeffer appro approached preparing for his educational experiment helped me to think about how homework from class didn't have to be just read something, write something, write a paper, read a chapter, but that we could actually think about what practices we engaged in together, not just because the practices are spiritually formative and because they're a good idea in and of themselves if we want to, uh, to learn about Christian life together, but also because engaging in the practices forced us into kinds of reflection that opened up all kinds of interesting space for actually thinking about Bonhoeffer. In other words, the practices were not just a devotional thing that we did alongside the classroom. The practices were something that actually led us into thinking that actually opened up new questions for us about Bonhoeffer's text and helped us to understand what he was doing. So as we think about Christian learning, we might just not just be thinking about Christian ideas and Christian content, but how we shape the kinds of practices in which we live together in learning environments.